Today I want to talk to you guys about why you should or should not run a CSA program on your farm. That's coming up next on The Urban Farmer. First of all, if you don't know what CSA is, I'm not going to explain it here. Put it into Google. CSA. Okay, so a lot of new farmers want to run a CSA. I guess the, the, the whole model has been really romanticized by a lot of new market gardeners, particularly my good friend Jean-Martin Fortier, and for good reason. CSAs are, are great things. They, they connect you to a really like-minded community group that will buy directly from your farm and you know there's there's a lot of good things about it you know the the uh the money up front which is the traditional csa model is great for new startup farmers and there's not much i can say against that i i, I think that's a really good thing first of all i want to talk about i'm mainly going to focus on why you shouldn't run a csa i'll also talk about why you might want to so i consult for a lot of farmers who have been running a csa or they want to start a csa and the usual situation is that they want to get into a CSA and they're on a small land base so they might be farming in an urban context and maybe they're on a half an acre or less and I always advise them not to do a CSA when they're at that size. The reason being is if your goal is to make a good living off that land if you're going to run a CSA program it means you have to offer a variety of different stuff to make your box be well balanced so that people will buy it you know if you're only growing salad mix and baby root vegetables and microgreens like i do then that's not really a good csa box so the reason you wouldn't want to do that is that if you had to grow vegetables like broccoli and kohlrabi and cabbage and melons and heirloom tomatoes then the value of your land goes down considerably because you have to grow lower value crops. Uh, a head of broccoli takes up about two and a half feet on a bed where a bed of salad mix like what I'm standing on here can be cut and come again many times and there's a higher value per square foot. So really what it comes down to is if you're on a small land base, to do a CSA will not deliver you the numbers that would maximize the use of your land. So on our farm we can do about a hundred thousand per half acre and really even more than that but if we were to do a CSA and we were growing kohlrabi and broccoli and cabbage and some of the crops I'd mentioned there's no possible way that we would get those numbers at least in in the context that we're growing. I mean who knows what's possible with technology today but um, and where agriculture is going, but in our context, those numbers just aren't possible. So this is why I mainly advise people to not do a CSA. One of the other reasons that I don't like doing CSAs, and I have run, I ran a CSA for four years, is you don't have cash flow. You get money up front, which is really great at the beginning of the season, but then you spend that money throughout the season and you don't have consistent cash flow coming in. And I don't like that, frankly. I like to have new, new sales tracking. I like to look at the numbers and say, oh, we did this much this week. Okay, we're gonna do this much the next week. I like to see that ca steady cash flow coming in. The CSA is just one lump of cash up front and by the time the season's over, you've pretty much spent it all. So, I mean, you know, that's a preference thing. That's not really um, a reason I would advise somebody to not do a CSA. The main reason is, is land size. If you don't have the land, then you're not going to get really attractive numbers off that. Having said all that, it all depends on what your goals are and what your outcome is. If, 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 you, if you have a half acre and, you, and you're happy with making 20000 there's nothing wrong with that. Then run a CSA. But, but I, I'm always trying to encourage farmers to make more off their land so they can have a better quality of life and they can maybe have some time off the farm a little bit instead of just grinding it out constantly. So those are the main ones. Okay, so some of the, those are some of the, the reasons why you wouldn't do a CSA. Let's talk about some of the reasons why you would want to do a CSA. And so there, the things that I really like about the CSA model is it allows farmers to not be so directly competitive against each other in the sense that 
you can really geog pick a geographical area and sort of target a market or a group of people in that area to deliver your boxes to or to service. Whereas when you're say a bunch of farmers selling at a farmer's market, you're in, in some way or another you are in direct competition with each other because you're competing for the same customers in that same little geographical area. Whereas a CSA, you can kind of choose the area that you want to service. The other thing that's nice about a CSA is that farmers can cooperate and I do this on, a, on our farm. We, we sell to three different aggregators that are kind of like C. they actually are CSAs in a way. So we're able to be part of a CSA that we're not directly organizing and, and there's, there's, there's some nice advantages to that. One is that it allows us to just grow certain products for those customers and so it allows us to specialize to some degree which, which I like to do. Um, so, so there's a way that farmers can get involved in a CSA without necessarily running a CSA themselves. But as far as you know, operating a CSA yourself, I would say you need you really need to be on more than a half an acre of land. And even if you're say within a half acre to three quarters of an acre, if you're running a CSA, what you'll probably do to get your numbers higher, your overall profit at the end of the year, is you will. I, w I would advise buying some of the realest low value products that, 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 that the farm would produce or put in the boxes from other farmers. So, you know, if you're on over an acre, then you can get into growing things like potatoes and, and maybe walla walla onions or, or melons or things like this. But you would be better off focusing on more of the higher value and maybe medium to higher value stuff and then sourcing the really low value stuff like say the potatoes, the cabbage, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the melons. You could maybe get those from another farm and then be a bit of an aggregator yourself and then you know have most of the product like say 80 to 90 percent of the product that you're producing for your CSA is coming off your farm but then you're, you're sourcing some of the other stuff from uh, another farm. So that's, that's, that's a that's a way to do it where you can get your, your profit a bit higher so that you're not dedicating your valuable real estate to land or to, to vegetables that don't make sense to grow on land in that context. So for example, things like potatoes, you know, growing potatoes, in, in my opinion, and I, and I fully accept that I could be wrong here, but in my opinion, potatoes are grown better with tractors. Hilling and all the labor that goes into them. I've grown, I grew a quarter acre of potatoes myself for three years in a row and I did all the hilling by hand and it's a ton of work. Well, I'd use my tiller to loosen up the dirt and then I'd hill them up with a rake. And it, it works and at the end of the day it still made a profit but it, it wasn't much. And uh, where I see people using tractors, the hilling is done really quickly. It just, it just makes more economical sense to, to use a tractor in that context. So there's just some things that are better to be done with machines on larger scales. I think potatoes are one of those. I think melons and winter squash are another one. Whereas, you know, even um, kohlrabi you can plant in, in, in intensive beds. Um, you know, many different <laughs> varieties of tomatoes, you can do that. And uh, there's all kinds of other crops, carrots and, and beets. There's many crops you can grow intensive that aren't, say, as high value as, say, salad mix or baby root vegetables or microgreens, but there's still things you can grow. So, um, but, you know, if you're, if you're running a CSA on an, over an acre, like up to an acre and a half, then you can pretty much grow most of the things yourself. Even then, I would still advise maybe buying melons and potatoes from another farmer. And so that would be, uh, uh, this is some of the reasons why, why you might want to do a CSA. The other thing is lifestyle. Running a CSA is a great, it's, it's fantastic. You build this community that really become attached to your farm. It's a really nice lifestyle thing and it's a really great community piece as well. There's also ways you can run a CSA as an urban farmer and I wrote about this in my book. I call it the urban farm broker and I've done, I did this for a year where our farm, which was at the time, but a third of an acre, we were sourcing other products from other farmers, pretty much just like what I mentioned to you, but on more of a smaller scale. So you could be, you could even start this, you could just start as an aggregator. You could run a business, and there's many of these out there now, where you're just buying product from other farmers, but you could grow some of the products yourself. And I think the advantage to that is that you get 
experience as a farmer and that's important and it's a way to transition into getting that experience while also building a customer base at the same time while also getting to know other farmers and learning from those other farmers and you you can build this business as you go as you learn so you could start with say growing on a quarter acre or less of salad mixes and microgreens and then aggregate everything else from other growers you could run a 300 person CSA doing that there's no reason why you couldn't and the nice thing about it is is from a from a profit standpoint you're making the profit on the highest value crops there so if you say microgreens and salad mixes those products have the highest markup and the highest return per square foot in in the time in their timeline so you're making a really high markup on those products and selling directly to the customer so you got a huge profit margin there and then you're aggregating other product from other growers where you have less of a margin but the but the bigger the numbers you do you know that's how you get your numbers up there so so there there's there's a lot of potential in that model by just working with other growers and also growing some stuff yourself so i hope that answers some of these questions i get this question a lot people are always asking me hey should i run a csa or should i not and just in conclusion if you're on a small land base it's generally better to not run a csa you're better off selling to restaurants and other aggregators and farmers markets but if you're on a larger land base and maybe you don't have access to good farmers markets or good restaurants then a csa is probably more for you so i hope that helps if you guys want to see more stuff like this please subscribe to the channel right now like and share these videos with your friends. Check out my online course, ProfitableUrbanFarming.com, where we get into a lot more of those kind of details. And a lot of this stuff is in my book at TheUrbanFarmer.co. All right, thanks for watching, guys.